Well, why don't we get started? Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this Translational Applications and Public Health Lecture, which is a collaboration between the Institute for Public Health and Medicine and the Northwestern University Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. I'm Namrata Kandula, co-director of the New Cats and IFAM Center for Community Health. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And during our presentation, I just wanna remind you to please use the question and answer function rather than the chat to submit any questions that you may have. Um, Dr. Fleming, who's our presenter today, may use the chat function to ask the audience some questions. And in that case, you can respond via the chat function. But if you have questions for the presenter, please use the Q&A function. We are gonna have time at the end of today's presentation for a dialogue with our speaker. I am very pleased to welcome our guest um, presenter today, Paul Fleming. Dr. Fleming is an assistant professor of health behavior and health education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He received his PhD in health behavior with a graduate minor in sociology from the University of North Carolina and his MPH in Behavioral Sciences and Health Education from Emory University. Um, I also just found out that he's a native Illinoisan who completed his undergrad at UI Urbana-Champaign. He has previously worked as a Community Health Peace Corps volunteer in Nicaragua, developing and implementing health programs, and also as a consultant on issues related to the social determinants of health. His mixed methods research focuses on the root causes of health inequities with a particular focus on developing and evaluating interventions that address those root causes. His recent community-based participatory research focuses on examining the impact of public policies on health inequities, including how immigration laws and policing practices impact community health. Dr. Fleming is on the Public Health Awakening Steering Committee and helps to coordinate the Michigan chapter of Public Health Awakened. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Fleming, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you. All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me here and for that introduction. Um, and thank you so much to all the organizers who make this uh, space available and make, um, you know, invited me here to speak. So I'm really excited to be here and talk about um, some of the issues I've been working on and thinking about lately. Uh, before I do dive into the presentation, I always like to just share a little bit more about myself. Um, you got a little bit of details about my professional life. Um, as, as was mentioned, I you know, studied and trained at Emory and UNC. And as part of that training, um, you know, at these top-notch schools of public health, I learned all about health inequities. I learned how to design health promotion programs, how to conduct CBPR research in partnership with marginalized communities and really how to think about health through a structural lens. And now, you know, after that training, much of my work uh, has focused on doing community-based participatory research um, to address health inequities, such as several uh, projects with immigrant communities, like this one, the Michigan Partnership to Address Immigration Stressors. Um, but the more I got involved in this work and the more kind of research studies and projects and interventions I was involved in, I really thought more and more about how the problem was so much bigger than anything a health program or a research project could address. Even if I did score that big multi-million dollar grant, there was still some fundamental truths that would remain about who gets resources in our society and who is held down. And that's really what today's talk is all about. So we're zooming kind of way out um, to see that how we structure and fund our society is what is what needs an intervention. And as and that we as health professionals are the ones that can help change it. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk a lot about policing and incarceration. And it's important to note that me as a white man with a PhD, I'm not talking from a place of personal experience. Um, people like me are not targeted with policing and incarceration in this country. I have, these, I have the privilege of thinking about these issues more from an academic place, right? Not because my spouse was racially profiled or my sibling was locked up. So this presentation, I wanna very much acknowledge, builds on the work of activists, right? So for many decades, Black, Latinx, Native American, or other people of color have been speaking out about the injustices or harms of policing and incarceration. Um, these, these flyers for protests back in the 50s and 60s um, in Detroit kind of allude to this, that this has been um, things that people have been mentioning for a long time. And of course, 
we see in the Black Lives Matters protests, people raising their voice um, again, people who have been impacted by policing and incarceration. I also want to acknowledge that uh, the presentation builds on the work of academics, many of them um, people of color who have raised the issue of policing, um, particularly in the last decade within the field of public health. And so the presentation I give today really builds on this work, not only the legacy of activists, but also um, the um, also the academic work that is done before it. So while I'm speaking to you today, I also want you to hear and listen to the voices of those who weren't given this same platform to speak with you. So for today's talk, um, just to give you kind of a guideline of where, where I'm going to take you. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about what is the problem. And here I'll be talking about the public health funding, funding paradox. Then we're going to talk about um, what is an example of this funding paradox. And we'll talk about the public health harms of policing and incarceration. Then we'll move to how did we get here, uh, which will be a brief and incomplete history of policing and incarceration in this country. And then what do we do about it using our collective power for change? And then I'll be excited to hear any questions and comments you all have in the audience. So starting with what is the problem? So we all should know if we study public health or medicine that we see persistent health inequities in this country. Um, I don't wanna dwell on these graphs because you've probably seen them before, but we see obviously in COVID-19, we see uh, stark racial inequities. With maternal mortality, we see stark racial inequities. Infant mortality, the same thing. And life expectancy, you can pretty much pick any health issue and we see these persistent health inequities. Uh, we are making a dent in some cases, but in other cases, inequities are actually getting wider. And this is kind of a persistent feature within our society. And so what I, one of the ways I wanna frame the issue for you today is the public health funding paradox. And this comes from a paper um, that I wrote with colleagues, uh, William Lopez, Marin Spolum, and Sandra Galea in Public Health Reports published last year. So what do we mean by the public health funding paradox? That the government and thus taxpayers are really subsidizing both policies that cause health inequities and the work by public health agencies to address them. So the government funding is both causing some health inequities and then also paying for us to clean up the mess. So if we think about health inequities, we know, especially when we take a structural lens or social determinants lens, health inequities stem in large part from gov government policies and practices that have distributed power, resources, and harms inequitably. So what do I mean by this? I mean that resources such as education or housing have been distributed inequitably, right? harms such as law enforcement or pollution have been distributed inequitably. Um, and of course, power is not equal across society. And so government policies play a really huge role in that, and so does government funding. Alongside that, we see that government-funded public health agencies are tasked with eliminating the resulting health inequities and improving population health. So again, some of the government policies are causing some of the health inequities, right? Creating these uh, disparities and inequities across our society. And then we're also paying health folks to fix that. So that we, we name the public health funding paradox. So I wanna talk about an example of this paradox, an example of funding the harm. There's actually a lot of different examples we could use if we think about um, certain subsidies we give for food and, and nutrition that cause harms to our diet. Um, we think about climate change and the way, um, you know, polluters are, uh, we, we subsidize and support polluters in certain communities. So those are some examples, but in today's talk, I'm really going to zero in on policing and incarceration as, an, as a prime example of a way that our government spends a lot of money on things that we know as health researchers, we know that it harms health. So this example, um, we spend $181 billion per year on policing, prisons, jails, parole, and probation. And if you're anything like me, you know, when we get into the billions, it's hard for me to contextualize it. So I want to give you some comparison points. So again, we spend $181 billion per year on policing, prisons, jails, parole, and probation. 
If we look at the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, of which the NIH and the CDC is a part of, so it's a part of this budget, the discretionary budget is 87 billion per year. So less than half of what we spend on policing prisons and jails. We can also look to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So another agency that we know addresses issues like social determinants of health, of housing, um, their budget is 48 billion per year. Another key social determinant of health education, if we look at the Department of Education federally, their budget is 64 billion per year. So when we talk about the paradox, we're in large part talking about the fact that we are spending so much money on these systems, right? And we are oftentimes underfunding these other systems that we know promote health. So the question of, does, do these policing and prisons and jail systems harm health? And we know from the news that we get bombarded with, uh, it seems almost daily, that there are many people that are being harmed by policing and incarceration, right? Um, we see examples of people, right, who were killed, taken away from their families, um, incarcerated for uh, decades. And so we see this in the news daily, right, or, or um, more often than, than any of us would like. And if we look to the public health research, the public health research is really starting to document the harms as well. So if we think about the public health impact of policing, in terms of the direct harms caused by police, that there are over a thousand people per year that are killed by police. In addition, there's over 50,000 young people that are known to be injured by police every single year. And that puts it about on par with young people who are injured in pedestrian accidents. So this is quite frankly, a public health issue. People are being, uh, people are dying and people are being harmed. And so that kind of puts it squarely in the place of public health. But it's not just those people who are affected, uh, people who are killed or people who are injured. It has many spillover effects. So we see that hypervigilance, what I mean by that is people who uh, are in communities who experience heavy policing uh, practice hypervigilance and that can cause mental and physical health problems. It has an impact on family and community cohesion, right? Because these are having an impact on families and how they live their life. And it's ultimately because the police is a government institution um, and directed by policymakers in the ways that it practices its policing, it really prompts mistrust in policing government. And we need to reflect now as we're seeing some vaccine hesitancy that has a lot of mistrust in government that police violence and the way police operates in our communities is in fact a source of some of that mistrust. We also need to think about inequities, right? I started this talk talking about inequities in our communities. So if we look at um, lifetime risk of being killed by the police, and this is as compared to uh, white people, we see that um, black men and black women are uh, almost twice or 2.5 times more likely than white people to be killed by police in their lifetime. And we also see a dis disproportionate impact on uh, American Indians and Latinx folks. One in 33,000 women in the US will be killed by police. And for black women, they're 1.4 times more likely and American win Indian women, 1.6 times more likely. Transgender folks are also disproportionately impacted. They're seven times more likely than cisgender folks to experience physical police violence. And the people who are most often uh, killed by police are men. So if we look at who will be killed by police in their lifetime, one in 1,000 black men and boys will be killed in their lifetime by police. That's a staggering figure and if, if you stop and think about it. We also see for any of these numbers, it's a staggering figure, frankly. Um, one in about 1,800 American Indian men and boys, one in about 1,800 Latinx men and boys, one in 2,700 white men and boys, and one in 6,200 um, Asian or Pacific Islander men and boys. So those are people who have died at the hands of police in our, in our communities. And for young black men, that's the sixth leading cause of death, being killed by police. So again, with these numbers, 
seeing the harms in communities, this is very much a public health issue. So policing um, often leads to incarceration, right? If, uh, if a community is policed, then there often leads to arrests, often leads to indictments, and often leads to incarceration. So what about the harms of incarceration? So we, we know from some research that um, for every year that a person is incarcerated, their life expectancy decreases by about two years. So if you have a five-year sentence, your life, you can expect that your life expectancy decreases by 10 years. Over the course of COVID-19, we saw that case rates were four to five times higher in jails and prisons than in the general population. And so there was a disproportionate impact. Similar to policing, prison has uh, many spillover effects. So um, just as an example of this, young adults who have had a father who was incarcerated were more likely than young, young adults without an incarcerated father to have a range of health issues. So high cholesterol, asthma, migraine, depression, PTSD, or anxiety. Um, and so if you think about, if any of you are researchers in this area, um, having an incarcerated family member is in fact a risk factor for some of the issues that you may study or you may focus on. So again, it's part of the health equation and part of health inequities. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this, but uh, people of color in this country are disproportionately incarcerated. And in particular, uh, black folks are most likely to be incarcerated. So we see that one in 10 uh, black men in their 30s is in prison or jail on any given day. And youth of color make up two thirds of youth, youth detention. So again, these are, in terms of the numbers that are incarcerated in our country, they're staggering, staggering but then the inequities within that is also staggering. So this has all led um, the American Public Health Association, our largest public health um, body, to um, pass some policy statements. So the first one, and this was passed in 2018, was on addressing law enforcement uh, violence as a public health issue. And what it did is it really named that this is a public health issue we need to focus on, and it really highlighted the ways that we need to think about alternatives to public safety in our communities that do not involve armed police. And this was supported by the um, Governing Council at APHA. The other one, which was more recent, passed last week, or not last week, last year, was um, advancing public health interventions to address the harms of the carceral system. So this one focused on the ways in which incarceration harms uh, people, causes health inequities, um, and again, recommends alternatives to our system of incarceration in this country. So again, to kind of summarize this section, simply put, police violence is a public health issue and causes health inequities, and incarceration is a public health issue and causes health inequities. And given all that, we still spend $181 billion per year on these systems that are causing health harms and causing health inequities. So I wanna move a little bit now into the next section, which is how did we get here? Um, so this is a brief and incomplete history of policing incarceration, because I'm only gonna spend you know, five to 10 minutes on it. So it's gonna be very incomplete. Um, I really like to focus on history. I teach a class on history of health inequities um, in, at the School of Public Health at University of Michigan. And I really think history helps us understand where we're at today and think about where we wanna go in the future. And I really love this quote that says, studying history aims to loosen the grip of the past. It enables us to turn our head this way and that and begin to notice possibilities. So by looking in the past at how our systems were created, we can then look to the, towards the future to think about how we want to transform the systems. So when we think about the origins of policing, um, our current system of policing is actually not that old. It has, um, in the US, it has origins in, in slave patrols. Um, and what the, the system of policing was really imported from London in 1838. Boston um, kind of copied London's model for policing. And before that, there really wasn't uh, the same type of uh, policing that we see today. So it's a relatively new system in our country, less than 200 years old. In the 19th century, we saw that the policing that did develop um, focused a lot on suppressing labor organizing 
So when there was strikes or other things, uh, policing were brought in to suppress those activities. And it also focused on oppressing Black Americans and immigrants and kind of keeping them in their place within cities or communities. Our modern kind of style of policing uh, really was established in the early 20th century. Um, and a lot of people credit August Vollmer as really the uh, founding father of our modern, modern system, system of policing. And there's a quote by him um, that I think is really important that we recognize the roots of our modern system of policing. So he says, for years, ever since Spanish American war days, I've studied military tactics and used them to good effect in rounding up crooks. After all, we're conducting a war, a war against enemies of society. And so you can see this kind of mili militarized nature of policing that took, took hold in the early 20th century. Um, and that's you know, why our police often have uh, uniforms that are militarized, um, using weapons, have uh, titles such as captain or lieutenant, right? So it has this roots in thinking about policing as a military endeavor, conducting a war against enemies of society. And what we see in the early 20th century is, you know, pretty large scale criminal, criminalization of black people. And we see that they're disproportionately patrolled, arrested, indicted, and of course, then disproportionately have guilty verdicts. And the other thing that's important to note um, is we see at this time that social scientists and policymakers are observing these statistics on patrols, arrests, indictments, and guilty verdicts and think, they conclude that, oh, Black people must be inclined to be criminals because they have higher arrest rates and higher indictments. And so that, that type of scientific racism and perspective um, took hold and it you know, still, still informs the system of policing today. So then if we speed, speed forward a few decades, um, in the 60s, the country was really thinking about um, crime, um, and increasingly thinking about um, drugs and how to address drugs. And so, you know, there was, a, there was a war on crime in the 60s and there was a commission on, in 1967, a commission on, commission on law enforcement and administration of justice. And in 1968, the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act. So in 1967, this government commission, which was pretty high profile, made the conclusion that warring on poverty Inadequate housing and unemployment is warring on crime. Money for schools is money against crime. Medical, psychiatric, and family counseling are services against crime. So basically what they were saying is if we wanna have a war on crime, we should be funding anti-poverty programs, we should be funding housing, we should be funding uh, medical services, right? So that was the conclusion of this report. But unfortunately, the very next year, we see that Congress um, and the president pass this Crime Control Act, and it actually shifted resources for addressing social problems to the police. So it dispersed money to 80,000 different crime control projects that were led by the police. So this is a moment in time where we could imagine that, what if, the, what if instead they made a decision to fund community organizations or to fund medical services or to fund um, housing programs, right? But instead they funded the police to address these social issues. And we can see in the graphs that uh, funding for police just continued to rise over time. So this first graph, you know, it's starting point of 1960 and this purple line is state and local spending on police per person. So we've seen a really steady rise over time, right? The orange lines are violent crime rate or overall crime rate. And we do see that there was an increase, right? Over the seventies and eighties, but then a market decrease um, since about 1990. And yet the funding for police continue to rise. In this one, we also see that from 1970 on, um, this uh, brown line is funding for law and order, and the blue line is funding for welfare programs. And we see again that the funding for law and order has, as a percentage of our um, public spending, has increased over time, whereas funding for uh, welfare has largely kind of been stagnant or decreased. So war on drugs policing is something that really developed in the early 70s and then got um, you know, turbo turbocharged in the 80s and 90s. It's something folks talk about a lot as um, you know, the, the cause of our system of incarceration right now and also leading to a lot of the harms that policing causes now. So what is war on drugs policing? It is 
policing that has uh, over time increased the number of police officers that target street level drug offenses. Um, it's characterized by strategies such as stop and frisk or the use of SWAT teams. It has increased funding for police and it has expanded police powers to permit violent and intrusive tactics. Um, in many of the cases, these strategies are targeted and focused specifically on Black and Latinx people in urban neighborhoods, and the research does show that out. Part of the war on drugs policing has been um, this transfer of military equipment to local police departments. This is called the 1033 program, and it has transferred over $7 billion um, dollars worth of military surplus, surplus equipment. This picture on the right-hand side is actually a slide from a slide deck of uh, military folks essentially advertising their equipment to local police departments. Looking for tactical vehicle, we have armored vehicles, um, tanks, et cetera, right? So this program essentially allows these local police departments to get this military grade equipment um, for free. And really that has contributed to the militarization of our police um, in our communities. And so this strategy of policing and these policies have really led to an increase in incarceration, which is really quite striking. Um, so we can see, you know, this graph starts at 1920 um, with relatively low rates, especially compared to now, of incarceration. But then in 1970, Richard Nixon uh, declares a war on drugs. And we see a, a somewhat uptick. And then in the Reagan era and the Clinton era, we see you know, a sharp uptick and it just continues to rise. So the Sentencing Reform Act in 1984 and then the Crime Bill. So these are, these are bills that extended sentences for folks um, and also, you know, disproportionately extended sentences for certain things and not others, which has led to a lot of the racial disparities that we see in incarceration. Um, so it's really skyrocketed over the last several decades. So our current system of incarceration is not the one that we've always had, right? Our society has not always had this, um, this system. The other thing to really note about our current form of um, policing is that policymakers and police use discretion. And I just want to note really clearly here that when I'm talking about policing, policymakers, which include people like city council, our governor, our other people, they are really important at setting the direction of how, how police act, right? So police as an institution bears some responsibility for this, but certainly the policymakers who are funding and directing the police also bear responsibility. And so po policymakers and police um, think about policing using discretion, right? So they determine which neighborhoods they'll target. So are they targeting more black, black and Latinx neighborhoods or white neighborhoods? They're targeting which locations to target. So are they policing and surveilling public housing units or are they policing and surveilling college dorms? And they're also um, choosing which crimes to target, right? So are they targeting street level drug sales or are they targeting examples of corporate theft, right? We have uh, thousands upon thousands of crimes on the books, right? Or, or criminal code on the books. And so the police are selective about which, uh, which crimes they really look for and go after. And it's important to note here that, um, you know, when we look at uh, black and white folks' use of drugs, for example, we see pretty much the same levels of drug use. And yet drug-related arrests for black folks is vastly higher, right? So there's 879 drug-related arrests per 100,000 for black folks compared to 332 for white folks. Um, and again, when you think about public housing versus college dorms, in college dorms, we know that there's drug use and drug sales going on, right? But they, they rarely are targeted for the type of surveillance um, and, and policing that uh, public housing is, is targeted with. And so this discretion really creates the in inequities we talk about. So again, thinking historically, simply put, police and incarceration budgets and power have grown over time. Um, and policing and incarceration are increasingly seen as, solu as solutions to social and health problems. Um, so we are, we are increasingly having the police deal with the issue of homelessness, deal with the issue of mental illness, and deal with other social ills, right? Um, and again, we are spending $181 billion per year on this. 
So now to the part uh, where we can, we can think about what do we want to do about it? How do we use our collective power for change? This is a monumental big task, um, but we have to start somewhere. And of course, many people have already uh, started and put decades of work into this. So how can public health and medicine help undo the funding paradox? Um, one of the ways I think about it is um, kind of in a, in a very professional role, we can think about restructuring, we can think about collaborating, and we can think about mobilizing. So in terms of restructuring, we, we first need to look in our own house, look internally at public health institutions, uh, academic public health, government agencies for public health, and we need to really rethink and restructure how we focus on health issues, right? So if we look at the NIH, for example, they are structured around disease categories. They're not structured around issues like institutional racism, right? Um, so what if we had a National Institute of Racism rather than having a National Institute of Mental Health, right? If we focused more so on these foundational drivers of health issues. The second thing is that we need to really enhance collaborations between the health sector and other government agencies that are responsible for things like housing, education, and public safety. So public, public health should be vocal about the fact that law enforcement or public, the way we think about public safety currently is not working for the health of our communities. It is very much a, a public health issue. This is a, this is a concept um, that a lot of people talk about as health in all policies, and it's a really important step that we all take. And then finally, we need to be mobilizing as public, as public health professionals or uh, medicine professionals and otherwise to advocate for policies that support health. I mean, that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit more about is how we mobilize. So first off, kind of as, a, as an internal thing with ourselves, we really need imagination for this, right? So again, I, I zoomed out and, and thought about our kind of, I've talked about our societal level budgets, funding, how we think about public safety. And if we want to shift these systems, we really need imagination. So we need to think about what would a transformed society look like? What if we started from scratch? What, what kind of systems would we create? I highly doubt we would create these militarized police systems and incarceration systems if we were starting from scratch. But rather, we kind of incrementally got there over time, right? So we need to really think and have imagination about what an alternative system could look like. Um, there's a series, I don't know if, if folks have seen it, but there's a series um, that is really uh, helpful for at least thinking about uh, reimagining public safety, right? So it kind of gives you examples and I'll just read the, the first one. Imagine someone is behaving erratically and in harm's way. And you could just text a number and an unarmed aid, urgent responder trained in behavioral mental health comes within five minutes. Right? So that is an alternative system that we could have. And in most places, we do not have that. So part of working towards this change, once we have the imagination to allow ourselves to think that we could live in a different world, is organizing, right? I'm sure, I'm sure you all have seen this quote that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And what that's all about is organizing, right? So coming together, creating communication channels. Um, if somebody has an idea, having a, a team or a network to be able to bounce that idea to and take action together. And that is such important work for advocacy that we do. So I want you to think about kind of what networks you're a part of or what groups you're a part of and how you might organize or strengthen that network to be able to take certain actions. In terms of taking collection action, there's a lot of different ways we can do it, right? So advocacy is not just one thing. Um, a lot of people like to think, oh, advocacy is, uh, is protesting, and it is, but it's also a lot of other things, or advocacy is a one-page policy brief, and it is, but it's also a lot of other things. Um, so there's a lot of different options you have, especially as a researcher or a public health professional, um, to engage in direct lobbying for certain programs. A lot of us, um, have platforms where we can um, you know, publish op-eds or white papers. Uh, we can meet with legisl legislators. Um, we can think about our own institutional policies. I'm guessing many people on the call have um, certain leadership in their own institution. And you can take the, do the work of advocacy to shift 
institutional policies. When you're forming a group and thinking about the change you want to make, right, there's some key strategies you can take, right? Um, so first off, you really want to be thinking about what your purpose, goals, and desired outcomes are. Identifying targets for what, what is the specific policy you're changing or what's the specific thing you want to achieve. Um, you are developing a strategy or messaging around that and then thinking about what tactics you use. Um, and the slide before is an example of tactics, right? In some cases, maybe a protest is the best way to get... Um, to work towards the change that you're looking for. In other cases, you might say the first step is to build a coalition. Or in other cases, you might say, we need to form relationships with policymakers. And so you wanna, depending on what your goal is, you might have different tactics. Um, you can use things like power mapping to identify who is actually has influence over this. Who is the policymaker? Who is the person who gets to decide? Um, and that can help you uh, target what you wanna do. Um, and then finally, for true equity, many of us hold privileges because of the education we have or our other identities. But if we want true equity, we really need to center the community or populations that are most impacted. So it's not us always as health professionals leading the way, but rather asking communities who are most impacted, how can we support, how can we lift up your efforts, how can we lift up your voices and, and help the cause that you've already been working towards. So I wanna just give an example and shout out to the uh, end police violence folks. I think this is a really great example of health professionals organizing for change that, um, that has had an impact. So I mentioned earlier in the talk about the two APHA statements about the harms of policing and the harms of incarceration. So that was a group of health professionals that came together, they collectively wrote a statement and then they built relationships and organized to help ensure that um, the larger public health community was on board with that statement and passed it as part of one of their policy recommendations. I'd encourage you to, to follow them on Twitter, um, end poll violence or, or visit their website, but it's a prime example of um, a group that that had different tactics, right? So this, this photo is actually a, um, a protest at, um, at the American Public Health Association conference in the lead up to the vote. Um, so it really kind of mobilized people to speak out and say, you know what, this really is a health issue. The other thing I wanna highlight is that um, I've been involved with Public Health Awakened. For, for those of you that aren't familiar with Public Health Awakened, it is a, um, it is a national group that organizes public health professionals around issues of social or racial justice um, and health equity. And so they formed about four or five years ago, and they've been really, um, really crucial at kind of uh, building a community of public health professionals who, are, who can take action on issues. Um, I've also been, so I would encourage you to visit their um, website and their, um, and their Twitter handle. And I've been involved in the Public Health Awaken Michigan chapter. So there's just a few chapters across the the country, unfortunately, there's not a Chicago chapter yet, but um, perhaps there could be in the future. But we are a group of different public health uh, professionals within the state of Michigan. Some of us are academics, some of us are our students, some of us work at state, uh, state and local public health or in nonprofits. And what we do is we meet every other week. Um, we have a listserv. We send out a Michigan Health Equity Digest. We have a Twitter handle. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to look into us, but some of the things that we've done over the past year, um, we've created uh, some educational materials for our, our community or our state. So this was one we created last summer on divesting from police and investing in community health. We were able to pull together some local statistics on, um, on the issue. We also did a campaign um, around election time, around public health being on the ballot. Um, so this was just one part of a social media toolkit where we, um, we distributed it and then kind of encouraged public health professionals to speak up about how um, public health was really on the ballot and voting for certain types of candidates would improve public health. Um, and we also came together to write um, in a few different cases about, you know, root causes of, of COVID-19 disparities in Washtenaw County and really get, get the word out um, about local issues. 
And then finally, I just want to talk about one kind of recent thing that we've gotten involved in as a chapter. And I think I think some of our chapter members are on the call. So hello to all of you. Thanks for coming. Um, and this is really a collective effort. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be able to share share what we're doing, but it's it's not my work. It's the group of the entire chapter. Um, but you know, in the city of Ann Arbor, they the um, the city council is considering an unarmed public safety response program um, to particularly to respond to issues of mental health crises. And so we, um, you know, we kind of seized on that and knew that we wanted to have a voice in shaping what that program looks like. It's still at the very beginning stages, um, but we've started to organize around this. So what we've done is we've started to build personal relationships with members of city council where we're able to share our perspectives. We gave public comment at city council meetings. Um, so we were able to share that with uh, the audience at city council and, and obviously the decision makers. And then we are coordinating with other organizers, um, including those who represent uh, folks who are uh, directly impacted by police violence or incarceration. And we're trying to coordinate with them to really um, kind of lift up some of the things that they're requesting or, or demanding. Um, and then finally, as part of uh, public health, we think it's our duty to kind of educate around this issue. So we're organizing a webinar around unarmed public safety programs across the country. They are um, kind of popping up all over the place as an example of an alternative to police um, that we can, we can use within our communities that uh, doesn't, you know, isn't as harmful as police and actually can respond with mental health professionals. Um, so again, we're excited about how this might develop and the role that we could potentially play in it. So I just wanna close with, um, you know, again, taking collection action is the way that we're gonna be able to transform these systems, right? And so you wanna think, I kind of encourage you all to just start thinking about who, who are your people? Who are, your, who are the people that you can take action with? Um, and if you don't really feel like you have someone, you know, seek it out. Um, what, one of the things I'm wondering, and perhaps you can either add it in the chat um, or, or share it some other way, is what groups are working locally um, to change your systems? I've, I've observed from afar, I know in Chicago, there's a lot of great um, health activists and folks focused on social justice. And so what are those groups and how might you get involved or your, um, you know, the research you do, how could it contribute to that? Um, and what groups could you join, right? So you don't always need to start from scratch to form your own group. In fact, it's much better if you can join groups that are ongoing or existing, right? And support those efforts in the ways that you can. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, for being a great audience. Um, I really look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Paul, for this very timely talk. And um, you've given us a lot to think about, including the idea of starting our own local Chicago chapter of Public Health Awakening, Awakened. So really appreciate it. I see several um, questions in the chat and I'll start with one that I think you showed a slide, but maybe we could revisit it. And the question was, is police brutality and deaths caused by police prevalently male. You mentioned stats for males, but nothing for females or other individuals on the gender spectrum. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. So I wanna be very clear and I'll, I'll try to zoom back to the slide. Um, police kill uh, men, they kill women, they kill girls, they kill boys, they, they kill um, non-binary folks, they kill transgender folks. And I do have some I can get back there, sorry. Um, hopefully I'm not making you dizzy. So, um, so about one in 33,000 women will be killed by police. It is a bit hard to find um, concrete numbers on the exact number of transgender individuals who are killed by police, but we do know that transgender uh, individuals are often targeted by police and that a high proportion of transgender folks report being harassed or um, uh, experiencing physical violence at the hands of police. So this is definitely um, an issue that affects all genders. If we do look at the numbers, um, it is disproportionately affecting men, which is um, kind of what I was highlighting here. So there are larger numbers of men that are killed, for example, than women. Um, but certainly it is, it is an issue that affects all genders. 
Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to see if we can answer um, what I think are two similar questions from Joe Feinglass and Pablo Dennis um, about are there examples of the types of things that we're talking about where communities are doing what we consider, um, you know, sort of addressing safety on a local level without policing and sort of good, the best practices are good practices. And then Joe followed up with, why are there no examples of different enlightened non-warrior pol policing in any US community? So I think kind of a similar question um, asked from in two different ways, like, are there no examples or are there examples? Yeah, I, I think that those are really good questions. So there are, um, there are definitely examples. Uh, so I'll start with kind of the first one about community-based programs. So there are a lot of um, community-based programs that exist within communities that are organizing, particularly communities that are heavily, um, heavily policed um, and heavily impacted by police violence, where they're organizing, um, organizing around, around the issue. But then also there's community-based programs that are addressing um, you know, issues of interpersonal violence or um, you know, response programs to respond to folks um, who you know, you know, you might think of need police support, but they don't feel comfortable calling calling the police, right? Because they're worried about what might happen. So um, some of the like violence prevention programs, for example, there's programs like um, Ceasefire or others that are more community led. Um, we see we also see these kind of community led unarmed um, unarmed response programs uh, in in the Bay Area in Oakland, um, and so those are some good examples. And then, you know, I think I don't have an answer for the question about um, police departments and are there no examples. Um, and I think you certainly do see some variation across police departments. Um, you know, every municipality basically has their own police department. So you're talking about thousands of different um, thousands of different groups. Um, and certainly you're going to see variation in there. But I think um, part of, at least how I see it, part of the problem is a, is a lack of imagination, right? Is that we, we haven't rethought in this society yet, um, you know, collectively, some people certainly have, but we have not um, rethought what public safety is or what public safety programs could look like. And so we sort of just um, follow the model that was established long ago, um, which is this more militarized version of, of policing rather than a more community focused version. And then kind of getting at that with um, sort of thinking about policing departments and is there room for change in how they police, there is a question about how do police and law enforcement trainings play a role in adding to the paradox? Do they have training to address implicit bias? Um, and I think that's an interesting question, you know, are those types of things helpful or do they just add to this paradox that you've described? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. So. Um, we do see oftentimes in response to instances of police violence that one of the kind of knee-jerk re reaction from policymakers is, and, and, and from the police as well, give us, um, give us money for training, which ultimately results in an increased budget for the police, right? So it does contribute to this paradox where that number, the amount of money our cities are spending on police grows. Um, in terms of training, um, that training can look a lot of different ways, right? And it's been used in a lot of different ways. But I will say that, you know, many of the police departments that have been involved in high profile police shootings lately have been previously labeled as exemplars of police and exemplars of having had received all the trainings that um, on implicit bias and other things. And so I guess just the point I want to make is that even among um, police departments that have received all the different trainings that um, folks say are important to reduce police violence, they are still um, they are still committing these harms, and that's because our policing system is set up in a way to create these harms. So again, I like to draw the attention away from kind of individual officers and more so thinking about what is this system of public safety that we have created. And it is inevitably going to lead to those harms um, because that's how we've created it. And it has its roots in, the, in that 
in that harm. It has roots in patrolling certain groups within a community and not patrolling others. And so if we really wanna think about public safety where all people in a society feel safe and not just um, white people or, or wealthy folks, then we need to create a, a system of public safety that addresses that. But our current system is really not designed in that way. And so even with certain types of training, it's not gonna fundamentally change how, um, how, these, how these harms are created and happen. So let me um, shift a little bit to a couple questions that had to do with some of the um, issues you were relate, relating to about sort of shifting funds away from policing to healthcare and public health. And this is a question from Keiki Hinami about um, compared to the law enforcement industry, which poorly manages the social determinants of health with $181 million, the healthcare industry does not do much better as a trillion dollar industry. Under restructuring strategies, any thoughts on charging ourselves healthcare with changing our own organizational practices? What can you say about shifting more healthcare dollars towards public health? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it's, um, it's a really important framing. And I actually, in some ways, I think of our current healthcare spending, um, in a way it's similar to our current policing spending in that our system of policing responds after a harm happens, right? That's the idea, that's, the, that's how we think about policing and public safety, is that it's responding after something has already happened, rather than thinking about, well, how do we prevent that harm from happening in the first place? Similarly, in our healthcare system, we are dumping, like you said, trillions of dollars into healthcare that is trying to address the issue after it already has happened, rather than taking a more public health approach that addresses the issue before it ever starts happening. So there's actually a lot of parallels there that in both cases, we need to be thinking about preventing harms before they ever happen. In our research, we know the answers. Um, you know, in some ways we don't need to do more research on this. We know that when people um, don't have housing or they uh, have unstable housing, that more harms will happen to them in terms of health and that they're more likely to commit harms oftentimes. We know that um, if somebody isn't able to access education or employment, that they're more likely to experience harm and they're more likely to, um, to perpetrate harm, that all of these things. And um, so we need to really take this more prevention, public health lens, both on our health spending and also on our, our systems of public safety. And to continue along these lines of kind of economic costs and um, you know persuading uh, governments to change how they're spending their money, this is a question from Michael Shapiro. Has your public health awakened organization looked at the cost of better education access and improved health equity as compared to the cost of incarceration as a way to persuade communities and states to modify how we spend our public funds? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I can't think of specific examples, although um, you know, Public Health Awakened operates kind of as a network. So there's certainly things um, that people have done and are doing and sharing that I'm not always attuned to. Um, I know that one, one area of focus has been on um, you know, policing within schools. So uh, thinking about uh, you know, school resource officers, um, and how spending for education has actually been diverted into those types of systems rather than put into education programs. So that is one area um, that I know Public Health Awakened and then Human Impact Partners, who um, is the kind of the, the group that they're under, um, have put out some resources on. But I think it's a really good, good question of thinking about education um, as well. So thanks for raising that. And maybe a contribution that we as public health professionals and health economists could make in terms yeah. of uh, providing evidence to support some of this work. Um, and then I think uh, a, a last question perhaps, which is often on my mind and happens with conversations with friends and family. So I've noticed a lot of, from Holly Duremo, I've noticed a lot of individuals who are not educated on the harms of policing make bad faith arguments. Like if we defund the police, we'll show up when my house is robbed. How can individuals work to combat some of these bad faith arguments? Yeah, no, I'm glad. Um, and I'm sorry, again, I'm giving you guys whiplash going through the slides, but I wanted to, um, 
I wanted to bring up these again because I think it's really uh, helpful and related. So absolutely, I think people have really legitimate concerns about the ways in which they currently think that police, um, you know, might be able to help them if something happens and really legitimate concerns of, well, if, if there's not police, then what am I going to do? And, and I think a lot of people have misconstrued this as, you know, that there would be just abandonment of, of individuals, right? So if harm were to happen, that there would be no support. Um, and in fact, what's, I think, you know, at least the perspective I take, and um, it's based on uh, what other folks have um, said is, you know, that it's not about, it's not about taking away. It's about what do we create in terms of support, right? So, um, and um, so there's, if you're, if you're taking money away from policing, you are putting it into other resources that are helpful, right? And so these, these um, posters are, are really good examples of actually thinking through concrete examples of when people maybe traditionally would consider the, the police as a resource and what might the system look like alternatively. Um, and so again, part of, part of that um, thing is a deficit of imagination, right? That our, our friends and family members may not be able to envision society in any other way. Um, and that makes total sense because we've all been swimming in it. As one of the questioners said, there aren't really examples of many of communities that don't have policing, right? So um, it, it can be hard for us to imagine it. Um, but if we really think through each issue that police, um, that we currently have police respond to, and then think about what could an alternative, like what would our ideal alternative be to that, we can start to envision a different system and, and, and one that actually makes a lot more sense. Like if someone's behaving erratically, it does make sense to send mental health professionals, right? Um, if you're experiencing intimate partner violence, is it make the most sense to send um, a police officer who are oftentimes men, oftentimes armed? Is that what makes the most sense? Or would it make more sense to have a trauma-informed crisis intervention response, right? So if you really think through all these different things, you can see and you can start to see alternatives. And so that's how I've talked about it with folks. Um, and these, these posters are really helpful. If you um, kind of Google the, the name and alternatives to police poster series, there's actually several more of these. There's, I think, about 12 or, or so um, that you can refer to. Well, fantastic. I think this is a great way to end our session is for us to all think about imagining uh, better systems and how we can collectively work together to create safer communities um, and shift, uh, shift our resources towards equity and, and the needs of our communities. So thank you so much, Dr. Fleming. It was wonderful to hear about your work and um, I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.